那我们今天非常高兴能够邀请到我们三位采访的教授，呃 ，Joshua Carter 来给我们做一场演讲。那在这之前，我们先请我们的大家长，就是我们王黄玉院长来给我们做一个简单的致辞。Professor Carter and Professor Yang， 嗯，在场的 ladies and gentlemen， 各位同学，大家午安。呃，今天我们非常荣幸邀请到 Professor Carter。来我们院里面，因为他获得本院的蔡万才讲座教授，呃的这一项奖项。那蔡万才讲座教授奖，其实我们是为了奖励国际学术交流，所以我们已经办了超过五年的时间。那这五年来，我们邀请世界各国法律学院、知名大学法律学院的教授，然后来呃接受这一个奖项。那这个奖项。的得奖者，他要来我们本院进行演讲。在疫情解封之后，其实我们非常的高兴，呃，孔教授今天莅临我们的院里面，亲自来跟我们的学生还有我们的教授进行这样的学术讨论。其实 Professor Carton can speak very good Chinese， 所以他有一个呃中文名字叫做孔家兴。等一下你们可以了解他的中文真的是非常好。告诉我，他其实学习中文学习超过十年以上时间。那今天其实我非常高兴，他也能来，之后他还会留在我们院里面为我们用英语授课。那今天我们在座还有陈伟佑陈老师，我又是这方面的专长，因为这个跟仲裁有关。他因为我们的这个仲裁应该也是一个程序法，对不对？所以我们今天是。呃，有关的教授其实都都到场。那我们的岳平老师，他刚接任我们的 WTO 的主任。呃，我们孔教授过去是我们前主任林彩玉老师，其实就已经很熟悉。跟我们呃去当 WTO 大使的罗三花老师也是旧识，所以在这样的一个呃学术社群里面，其实我希望我们院里面。可以在这样的一个 WTO 或是国际仲裁领域的这个学术社群，呃，可以借由这样的国际交流，然后进一步的去影响，发挥更大的影响力。我想，我们 WTO 或是这个国际仲裁这个领域，应该是要持续推动。那这个领域，它其实非常需要各种国际上知名教授来。大家形成一个社群，那未来有机会的话，如果大家对这个领域有兴趣，我相信我们未来台大法律学院可以提供更多这样的一种学习机会。谢谢各位。呃、uh, ，allow me to introduce Professor Carlton. I actually know Professor Carlton for a while,、uh, particularly since 2014,、mm -hmm. and during that year. Uh, professor Carton was a visiting professor to our law school, and he also not only teach、uh, arbitration laws here, but also instructs our vis MOOC core team to participate in a very famous international arbitration MOOC core competition. And that year, we had a very good success. So I, I, I actually attributed that to、uh, Professor Carton.、Uh, unfortunately, Professor Carton did not、uh, return to our college、uh, visiting us. Uh, from、uh, since then, but now we have a privilege to invite him、uh, using a very special、uh, title of the Taiwan Sai Visiting <laughs> Scholar、uh, to invite him back, and he will stay with us for a year. He will teach、uh, in our campus both in this semester and the next semester, and he will、uh, cover a lot of issues, including commercial arbitration, international dispute resolution, and more general、uh, transnational laws. And today he is going to share with us a topic on globalism versus cosmopolitanism. I guess a lot of people will be confused、uh, what this topic is actually about.、Uh, a very basic understanding would be that、uh, we, we fail to see any term of arbitration in this title. And actually, Professor Carter is going to give us more than just、uh, arbitration laws or international arbitration laws, but thinking about laws from a global vision. And especially tackling two conflicting visions of legal globalization, so、uh, this would be something that is less familiar to、uh, Taiwanese audience because
we know globalization, we know the globalization of law, but at the same time, we also think that law is a very localized thing. So why Professor Carpenter comes up with this idea and what he is going to uh, deliver to us, uh, I'm very intrigued. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Carton to give us a speech for about uh, 45 to 50 minutes. And then we'll pass it forward to the audience and uh, we can communicate more. Thank you, Professor Carton, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this was a, a, a very difficult title to try to translate into Chinese. Um, and I think maybe a lot of people were confused by it. But in English also, the words are confusing and they're not very different. Um, and part of my goal today is to try to explain what I mean by these terms. Uh, this lecture brings together a few different themes that have interested me over the past few years. Um, I came to this topic from studying international arbitration. But uh, I think arbitration is just one example of the kinds of trends and phenomena that I'm going to talk about today. Um, this particular topic is new to me. This is a, a freshly written lecture. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested to hear what, what questions and comments you might have, because this is definitely uh, a work in progress. So one of the, the hot topics these days in, in legal scholarship, but really more in the financial and political media, is what I keep hearing called deglobalization. So we're told that the COVID pandemic combined with the decline of neoliberalism in political and economic ideology, the rise of nationalistic politics in many countries, tensions between China and Russia on the one hand, and the West, on the other hand, uh, supposedly, right, this all means a decline in globalization itself. So you can see here the, uh, the Economist tells us to say goodbye to globalization. Uh, the London Times regrets globalization is ripping up, uh, the deglobalization rather, is ripping up the global trade order. The Financial Times warns corporations uh, not to overlook this trend of deglobalization. The Harvard Business Review says that uh, deglobalization might hurt uh, American businesses. What I want to tell you today is that these commentaries have all misunderstood what's happening. I don't think there is any deglobalization. What's actually happened is that a balance has shifted between two different trends or two different versions of globalization, both of them coexisting for over 100 years. So there's a few different ways to think about these phenomena, what, what motivates them, what goals they're trying to achieve, what kinds of laws they produce, how they interact with each other. So as you've probably guessed, I call these two strains globalism and cosmopolitanism. And perhaps the, my, my single most important goal for this lecture is to define those terms and to describe uh, what I mean by these words. But to get there, I think we have to, to back up uh, a little bit. But first, I should say that I'm going to be speaking only about private law uh, in today's discussion, in particular commercial law. There is a lot to say about the globalization of public law, especially administrative law, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, but that's just outside the scope uh, of what I'll be discussing today. It's, it's not because I don't think it's important. You just can't cover everything. Um, but when I talk about globalized private law, that's not to say that it deals strictly with business-to-business -business relationships. It can involve regulation of business, so government regulation. Uh, it can involve treaties, right? those characteristic creations of, of public international law. But they will be treaties of a particular kind, uh, which don't attempt to regulate the behavior of countries in their relationships with each other, which is the sort of classic meaning of a treaty in international law. Instead, they try to harmonize the way that different countries regulate private conduct. Um, and uh, Din Wang mentioned uh, Professor Lo Changfa, who's been a, a mentor to me, as well as to, I think, countless legal scholars in Taiwan. He wrote a very interesting article, I think, at very early identifying these treaties. He calls them treaties of a private law nature and describes them as a different category from the historical understanding of what a treaty is. I simply call them global laws. 
to distinguish them from national laws on the one hand and international on the other. They aren't between countries. They're trying to get past the idea of countries in many ways. So what is globalization of law? For over a century, don't, don't worry that you can't read the words. You're, you're not supposed to be able to. Um, for over a century, this concept has been associated with establishing harmonized, unified rules governing private conduct. So a, a 1993 article by an American professor, Martin Shapiro, one of the earliest I found that uses the words globalization and law in the same sentence. He describes globalization of law this way. He says, we might refer to the degree to which the whole world lives under a single set of legal rules. Such a single set of rules might be imposed by a coercive actor, might be adopted by global consensus, or arrived at by parallel development in all parts of the globe. So there are some key points about this definition that Shapiro gives that I want to discuss. First, it defines legal globalization in terms of legal unification how much of the world lives under one set of rules. For law to be globalized according to this definition means for law to be unified or harmonized on the way to being fully unified. Second, this definition is statist in its orientation. So what I mean by that, although it accepts that single sets of rules might come from different sources, might be imposed by a, a superpower, they might be arrived at by consensus, they might uh, develop from independent evolution in different countries. But one way or the other, this definition of globalized law sees states as the place where law is made, either acting separately or collectively. So those two perspectives, that globalization means unification of law, that it means harmonization of national laws. That's not the only way to think about legal globalization as I'm going to discuss. But you can trace this pair of ideas back to the very first organized attempts at creating global laws during the first great age of economic globalization in the late 19th century and going roughly up to World War I. So that first generation of international uniform law instruments, as we now define that term, they all had to do with harmonization of the law of obligations, especially of commercial contracts, mostly among civil law jurisdictions in Europe. That is, countries that had similar legal systems and that had very strong bilateral trade relationships. So from the beginning, legal globalization was a reaction to globalization of society, especially globalization of business. That also is a theme that we're going to see coming back again and again. Legal unification has long been a goal, a hope, of the commercial law community. Commercial practices don't follow national borders. Traders in a particular industry have more in common with other firms in the same industry in other countries than they might with businesses in a different industry in their own home country. But if they do transact across borders, they run the risk that an unfamiliar law will apply. Uh, and they will be in unfamiliar territory, possibly confronting risks that they didn't contemplate because those risks don't exist under the law of their home country. They might have to hire foreign lawyers who are unfamiliar with their business. Lord Justice Kennedy, the, the chief judge of the English Court of Appeal, he put it this way in a speech to the English Law Commission in 1909. You'll see the language is old fashioned, but the, the, it could have been said this year or last year um, in terms of the content. He wrote, conceive the security and the peace of mind of the ship owner, the banker or merchant who knows that in regard to his transactions in a foreign country, the law of contract, of movable property, of civil wrongs, is practically identical with that of his own country. Or to put the same thing differently, that the courts of the foreign country would deal with questions in the, in the same way they would be dealt with in his own country's courts. Now, Lord Justice Kennedy was focusing on cross-border sale of goods and all of the different contracts that support sale of goods like shipping and financing. And that's probably not surprising, given that that was about 120 years ago. But the same sentiment persists. In fact, it hasn't really changed at all, even though the business context 
has completely changed. So here's a quotation from a publication of the United States Chamber of Commerce from just four years ago called Preventing Deglobalization. Uh, and it's specifically looking at the internet and telecommunications sector. And it argues that governments, in particular the American government, it is the American Chamber of Commerce, should take steps to preserve what they call the borderless character of the internet and communications sector. They write, globalization of the internet and communications sector has been one of the most powerful drivers of global economic welfare over the past two decades. In such a globalized industry, poorly conceived security-related rules that erect trade barriers along national boundaries may in practice burden industry while failing to achieve legitimate policy objectives. They also may limit competition and the economic benefits of participating in a global telecommunications industry without providing security benefits. So in short, the Chamber of Commerce assumes that more nationalized laws hurt economic growth, while more transnationalized laws, more borderless legal regimes, promote prosperity. They also assume that deglobalization means a reduction in how harmonized laws are. It means more differences among national laws. But globalization is not necessarily joined with harmonization. And indeed, I'm going to go back again to the late 19th century. From the very start, the movement to create more uniform commercial laws was fragmented from the very beginning as efforts were made to harmonize little bits and pieces of the law uh, as you know, wherever sort of they felt that it could be achieved. This one, again, was especially true in Europe. At the beginning, some of these attempts at unification of law were almost laughably small, like specific and narrow. There was an 1891 Madrid agreement for the repression of false or deceptive indications of sources on goods an 1893 convention concerning the carriage of goods by rail. The same year, 1893, the Hague Conference on Private International Law was established, an independent NGO that has been a source of uniform law still to this day. The Hague Conference produced such documents as a 1924 convention on the unification of rules relating to bills of lading, a 1925 agreement on the international deposit of industrial designs, a 1928 convention on the carriage of passengers and luggage by train. I'm not going to keep going. You get the idea that they were creating little, very narrow bits of harmonized law. At the time, really just trans-European, but in the future, global. But for very specific areas of the law of obligations. That same time period, what we now call the interwar period between World War I and World War II, was a time of huge ambition in legal globalization. It also saw the foundation of, a, of another uh, institution that's still very important in the field, UNIDRA, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. Now, not all of the instruments that bodies like the Hague Conference and UNIDRA drafted have been successful. For example, in the 1960s, the Hague Conference produced two conventions on the sale of goods one on the formation of sale of goods contracts and one on implied obligations of buyer and seller called the ULF and ULIS. Both were ratified by only nine countries, eight of them in Western Europe. And they faded back into the background because they simply didn't get adopted. But after 20 years, UNCITRAL, the UN Commission on International Trade Law, found success with the Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, or CISG, which is now the law governing cross-border sales of goods in around 90 jurisdictions. What these efforts have in common is a kind of top-down style. They are piecemeal, right? They are taking individual bits of law and trying to harmonize them in areas where a, a lack of harmonized law, where legal differences among countries were seen as especially a problem for business. But they don't challenge traditional ideas of what law is namely statutes enacted by the legislatures of states, implemented by the regulatory bodies and judges of those states. They might have their origin in international law, whether as treaties or as model law, 
but they are old school, you know, classical state lawmaking. Their structure, therefore, is like that of the corporate organizational chart. The chart you see on the left, uh, the org chart. Um, so they divide the law up into categories and subcategories, enact legislation relating to one or more of those subcategories, and that legislation takes its place within the pre-existing structure found in the codes and statutes of individual jurisdictions. It's lawmaking at the international level, but using ordinary state lawmaking procedures. Two treaties in particular are cited as the greatest achievements of this legal unification movement. Uh, the first I just mentioned, the CISG, which has unified the law of sales for about half the jurisdictions in the world, including most of the major trading economies. The other is the New York Convention, formerly the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. The New York Convention is often described as the most successful commercial law treaty ever, just as the CISG is often described as the most successful contract law treaty. But think for a moment, successful in what way? Does the New York Convention have the best rules for governing international arbitrations? No, it came into force in 1958. It's outdated in a lot of different ways. Like any treaty, it's the product of diplomatic compromises. It has gaps, it has ambiguous provisions, right? But it recently reached 170 ratifications. Indeed, every commercially important jurisdiction is a New York Convention member state, with the sole and striking exception of Taiwan for reasons that I do not need to explain to this audience. The only treaties with more ratifications are the United Nations Charter and the other treaties like the ICJ statute that every UN member state is required to ratify. It is the near universality of the New York Convention that makes it successful, not its quality, however you would define quality. But even as state-centered efforts to unify law were growing, an entirely different form of lawmaking was taking place at the same time. It also had its roots in the late 19th century, kicked into high speed in the interwar period, and then expanded dramatically again after World War II. This kind of lawmaking does not start with states, and it may not even involve states, although it often does involve state entities at some point. It responds to what Halliday and Schaefer in the definitive book on transnational legal orders call mismatches between markets and law. For the most part, it is drafted, it is disseminated, it's enforced by non-governmental associations of private sector actors, mostly business corporations, or simply by the community of companies working in a particular sector. The huge variety of these kinds of institutions makes them hard to categorize as a group. So take, for example, international standard-setting organizations. These are bodies, some intergovernmental, some non-governmental, that establish standards for particular industries like uh, weights and measures, technical specifications, and the like. They ensure that equipment will be interoperable across countries, predictable meanings of labels and symbols, and, and some degree of quality control. The vast majority of these organizations and the standards that they issue have no formal legal status of any kind. <clears throat> and the institutions have no ability to legally require manufacturers to use their standards. But in practice, they have the power to require individual companies to design, to manufacture, to label, and to transport their goods in specific ways. Many have the ability to impose sanctions for non-compliance, and many have their own separate uh, associated dispute resolution mechanisms. In short, each one is its own tiny independent legal order, specially adapted to the particular subject matter or geographical scope that it was established for. There's a dizzying number of these, by some counts tens of thousands around the world, several hundred fairly major ones. Uh, some national, some regional, some global. The three most important uh, are the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, probably best known just by that acronym, uh, the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, and the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. The ITU and IEC were founded <clears throat> in 1865 and 1906, respectively. They're much older than a lot of people realize. 
the ISO in 1947, just after World War II. The ISO and IEC are entirely private, non-governmental organizations. They have no treaty basis. They started with consortia of industry practices. They remain mostly private sector. They select their own members, which might themselves be public or private, although the ISO's membership is mostly national standard setting organizations, which depending on the country might or might not be government bodies. By contrast, the ITU is a treaty-based organization, established by a vote of states in the United Nations General Assembly after years of negotiations. Today, although it's nearly a century older than the UN, it's a permanent agency of the UN, and states are its members. So even in just the three most prominent standard-setting organizations, we have treaty-based and non-governmental structures, we have public and private sector membership, we have sector-specific or broad scope of authority. And then the standard-setting organizations are just the more institutionally established, the more state-like of the many other kinds of private international institutions that impose governance, you know, rule-based law-like governance on the sectors where they operate. An example from my field, the IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest in international arbitration. Formally, it's just, it's not even a book, it's, it's a pamphlet. It's about 30 or 40 pages long, published by a committee of the International Bar Association. Uh, private lawyers who are elected by other private lawyers who are members of the International Bar Association. And yet, in reality, they set the standard for when arbitrators in international disputes have to be removed for conflicts of interest, for lack of independence and impartiality. Who empowered a committee of the International Bar Association to make such rules? Who empowered the ISO to set standards on everything from contact lens solution to the thickness of fruit purees and smoothies to the shape of USB plugs, right? Much less, who empowered them to charge a fee to private companies who want to use their standards, even though businesses really have no practical choice but to use their standards? Uh, of course, the answer is nobody empowered them, uh, but also everybody empowered them because now every commercial actor accepts the standard setting organization's power to set those standards. New entrants to the market are willing to pay the ISO's fees. They voluntarily comply with the standards set by the other bodies because otherwise, right, they would not be able to participate in that market. Incumbent firms, they might grumble and complain about the ISO from time to time. They might try to lobby them to change, but none of them are seeking to exit, right? So why do incumbent firms and new entrants play along with the standard setting organizations? Because ISO certification has value. I don't mean value in money terms, although it probably does increase sales, so it has a value in money terms. I mean legitimacy, I mean authority, like law has. This kind of bottom-up rulemaking effort draws power from the network itself that participates in it. Scholars of transnational law call this kind of spontaneous rulemaking within an integrated social group autopoiesis. It's a term from evolutionary biology which describes the capacity of organic life to reproduce itself, right? So like when a cell divides, all the information that it needs to copy itself is contained in the nucleus, right, in its DNA. There's no external force that tells each of the billions of cells in your body to divide and, and replace themselves, right? Once it's set in motion, right, it is self-sustaining and self-reproducing. So much of what we now call transnational law is similar, right? autopoietic. This is particularly visible in commercial laws that are the focus of my research. Commercial communities often find themselves in a situation where market and law are mismatched. Perhaps the law is outdated like it makes no provision for formation of contracts by electronic communications, or it imposes interest rates that have no relationship to the actual cost of capital for businesses. Uh, or, or seemingly simple things like a country has no easily searchable registry for patents, so you don't know whether your technology violates an existing patent or not. I have some experience uh, consulting in countries where the courts are so slow and so incompetent, or perhaps so corrupt, that the overwhelming majority of commercial disputes are settled through arbitration. 
where arbitration has effectively displaced the court system as the formal standard default means for resolving commercial disputes. Right? And that's only within a single jurisdiction. I'm not even talking cross-border at that point. So what do we say to firms that have to navigate this complex legal environment in which some jurisdictions are backward, some are modern but highly politicized or unstable, some are highly responsive to the needs of business? Just the variety and the unpredictability alone imposes significant transaction costs. So where state regulation is inappropriate or is fragmented or just unprofitable, commercial firms are going to try to find ways to regulate their own behavior and to keep each other in line and maintain a fair playing field for competition. This can occur in the smallest, narrowest categories, uh, like Robert Ellickson's pioneering research on what he called spontaneous legal orders among cattle ranchers in California, or on a truly grand scale, like the establishment of institutions to govern whole sectors, like the modern supply chain management industry. In legal scholarship, the theory of autopoietic law is most associated with two German scholars named uh, Gunther Teubner and Niklas Luhmann. Teubner, for example, writes, internal differentiation of law can be seen as a response to the fragmentation of society into various systems and discourses. Using different terminology to make roughly the same point, the British socio-legal theorist, Roger Cotterell, describes what he calls networks of community as the places, the focal points where transnational rulemaking happens. He writes that such networks are defined by stable, sustained interactions within the community and by a sense of attachment then that develops among those members of the community. The thing is that once common practices are adopted, right, they become self-sustaining. This is the autopoiesis part. And the theory that explains how and why they become self-sustaining is taken from economics. And that's the theory of network effects or network goods. So in economic theory, that the characteristic of a network good is that their value increases the more people adopt them. Right? Joint, the, the size of the network itself is its source of value. Right? So that joining a network doesn't just benefit the joiner, it benefits all the other members of the network. So think of the standard setting I just described, like USB plugs. If you're a new electronics company that wants to make uh, you know, peripheral uh, devices, you have very strong motivation to use the same USB plug so that your device will be usable with you know, all different kinds of computers. Right? What makes the USB design valuable is its universality. Uh, I'm not an electrical engineer. Maybe, maybe there's a better way to do it. Uh, but now it would be very difficult to displace the USB standard because it has become so universal. So this is the, the other characteristic of network goods as described by economists, that they have a tippy quality, tippy as in a tipping point. Once they reach a certain degree of spread in the community or around the world, they tip to the point that it is cheaper and easier to join the network than to try to fight it. Standardization just creates more standardization. And pretty soon we find that not only codified best practice standards, but also institutions, associations, networks of third party service providers reinforce the norms established within the community. Existing members of the community find that they are bound to follow the rules. New entrants find that they have to educate themselves in order to comply with the rules. And pretty soon you have an internalization of the rules such that all of the firms involved think, well, this is just the right way to do things called socialization or internalization of rules. This is similar, if you've studied public international law, to the notion of opinio juris in customary law, that states follow not just what are widespread practices, but it becomes law when states follow those practices because they think they are legally bound to do so. The same thing happens in private networks. So the result of this process of generating, disseminating, internalizing, enforcing rules is, this is the, the dominant term now, is a transnational legal order. But whatever vocabulary one adopts, these studies make clear that transnational law, that globalized commercial law, can develop in a disorganized, organic, polycentric, multi-centered, pluralistic way. Right? Corresponding not to the structure of the Westphalian state system, but to the structure of the communities that compose it. 
So instead of a corporate org chart, they have the structure of a social network with groupings of dense interactions and nodes that are points of connection to other groups. This might also remind you of something else, which is the structure of a living organism. Right? So one of the things that differentiates biology, biological organisms from you know, human-made designs, right, is the, well, what we call the organic nature of their structure. So right, here we have on the left right, the computer chip, which is planned, it's designed with the central processing unit at the center. Right? The circuit board centers on that in a logical, efficiently planned way. On the right, right, the neural network, not planned, grown, not designed, evolved, defined by the number and variety of its internal interconnections. But okay, so far, this has all just been descriptive right, of these two different sort of uh, um, objective existence of two different trends in the development of globalized law. But my lecture title promised a clash of visions, so I'm going to turn to that next. The two kinds of transnational lawmaking that I've been describing are associated with two ideologies or two mentalities relating to globalization of law, which I call globalism and cosmopolitanism. Now, those are both contested terms. As I've already discussed, they're ambiguous. They have political baggage, in particular in, in American right-wing politics. Globalist has become a sort of an insult. Right? So they're maybe not the best words for this, but they're the best that I could think of. Right? I admit they aren't ideal labels. Globalism is, in a way, the original ideology of globalization. Political scientists use the term to describe those who advocate for globalization as a normative ideal or goal, right? as opposed to those who just describe objective processes of globalization. So for many commentators, globalism is the ideology, the sole or the primary ideology of globalization. Uh, political scientists Manfred Steger and Paul James have described globalism as the equivalent of nationalism, right? So that in their telling, what nationalism is to the nation state, globalism is to the globalized world community. But now I'm sure you're going to realize I'm going to disagree with the idea that that's the only ideology of globalization, right? And I'm going to describe cosmopolitanism as an alternative ideology or alternative vision. In fact, I think it's the wrong assumption that globalization means globalism or is necessarily motivated by globalism that is the reason for that misunderstanding of the current political context that I described on my first slide. So Steger and James portray modern globalism as kind of the, the, the heir, the modern version of ancient imperialism, such as the Roman or Chinese empires that sought to extend their ideologies and cultures to what they saw as the barbarians surrounding them on all sides who needed civilizing, their known worlds. Globalism is not necessarily opposed to the Westphalian system of independent nation states, but it's kind of indifferent to them. Right? It doesn't really focus on nation states as something important. Globalists see economic, political, and legal integration of states as something that is good in itself, right? that should be pursued for its own sake, and also, in some cases, as a step along the way toward a world government, or at least to a single global legal order in which nation states might be culturally significant, but they're not legally significant. At the same time, globalism is fairly traditional in its methods. It works through state governments interacting with each other, legislating internally to achieve its goals through the adoption of treaties and statutes based on international uniform model laws. In this way, for the states that follow it as an ideology, globalism is a kind of self-denying doctrine by which states deliberately and voluntarily recede or pull back from governing cross-border conduct like that engaged in by multinational companies. For this reason, while globalism is not the same thing as neoliberalism in economics, they are consistent with each other and do often go together. The best metaphor for globalism that I've seen is taken from sort of the American cultural context, which is the so-called <clears throat> melting pot that you can see on the left. Different metals go in, right? What comes out is an alloy, a single blended metal that is shinier, maybe stronger, maybe more rust resistant uh, than the separate metals that went into it. Not so much greater than the sum of its parts as a whole new thing, right? composed of ingredients that once were separate but have lost their distinct identities. So globalism seeks to combine world cultures, states, legal systems, 
into a single global entity within which there might be variations, but to the extent that such variations continue to exist, they're not really important. A purely private law example of globalism is the so-called lex mercatoria. It just means the law of merchants or merchant law in uh, Latin. This is a highly contested concept, but the theorists who propose it describe it as a unified but kind of implied, not explicit, global law of commerce, the set of trade usages common to all businesses engaged in cross-border trade. It's kind of the private law equivalent of general principles of law in the public international law context. Lex Mercatoria is seen as autonomous or independent from states, authentically derived from purely private interactions, but still enforceable in state courts. It's posited to be uniform, both in the geographical sense as a single law for the world, but also in that it crosses industry boundaries. Now, critics of the Lex Mercatoria concept say that it's just kind of the lowest common denominator of contract law. Uh, pacta sunt servanda, you know, contracts should be kept. And really not much else that really the whole world can say it has in common with respect to contract law principles. And indeed its unpredictability has made it unpopular with the commercial parties who supposedly are the source of it. It appears very rarely in choice of law clauses in commercial contracts. Maybe that's not surprising, right? Commercial parties prize predictability in the law more than anything else. I think even more than good laws, businesses want consistent laws so that they can predict with confidence what the consequences will be if they use this language or that language in their contract. But leaving that aside, Lex Mercatoria shows that private lawyers can be just as globalist, just as homogenizing as public lawyers, right? or any economist for that matter. By contrast, the metaphor that's often given for a cosmopolitan society is that of the mosaic. Each component, each tile in the mosaic maintains its separateness. Right? You can see the mortar separating each tile from its neighbors. But together they create a single unified image, both many and one at the same time. Like globalism, the term cosmopolitanism has multiple meanings. Right? I'm using it in a non-technical sort of way here just to describe a set of cultural commitments that are anti-nationalist but do not insist on homogenizing, on unifying, right? that are accepting of or even they revel in cultural differences. Cosmopolitans are the, the kind of people who might describe themselves as citizens of the world. So rather than being totalizing, right, universalizing, cosmopolitan law is particularistic. It seeks specific solutions to specific problems, often in response to a demand from commercial parties to have their affairs treated by expert specialists. It makes no claims about where those specific solutions ought to come from, except that it really prioritized that specialist expert knowledge. Like water, cosmopolitan law fills cracks, in this case, cracks in the international legal order. Often that means enlisting states as supporters rather than originators of legal developments. So we see entirely private legal orders constituted by widespread use within a commercial community, supported by state courts, and then eventually codified into state laws and made sort of concrete and formally legal that way. But which did not at the beginning depend on states for their legal legitimacy. A good example is the so-called FIDIC books. So FIDIC is a, it's a French acronym for the International Federation of Consulting Engineers. It's a private industry group in the construction industry. The standard form contracts that FIDIC has developed are so comprehensive, so widespread in the construction business that they can constitute a complete law unto themselves. That's why they're called books. They're just very long, right? very comprehensive. Uh, a senior arbitrator who I interviewed for a book a few years ago uh, told, told me about a, a major commercial arbitration award, a multi-hundred million pound dispute, this was a, a British barrister, uh, that he had just finished writing the award as chair of the tribunal, he said the award was over 80 pages, it did not contain a single citation to statute or case law, only to the contract, because the contract is so comprehensive it could resolve all questions in the dispute. I say FIDIC books, not book, because there are several different options depending on the kind of construction contract, 
the industry sector, even the geographical area, because different climates you know, present different kinds of uh, technical considerations for construction. A hallmark of cosmopolitan law is that it avoids one-size-fits-all approaches and prefers kind of menu of options approaches. So perhaps the, the, the best known example are the INCO terms, those three-letter terms used for shipping contracts like FOB and CIF. Right? When I teach sales law, students ask me, well, which one is the best? Which one should we use? And I say, well, if, you, if you're asking which one is the best, you've missed the point. Right? The point is there isn't one that's the best. There are different ones that are better for different transactions, for different pairs of parties from different countries, dealing with different customs procedures right? and you know, different uh, geographies that their goods pass through. Uh, the kind of best modern example of cosmopolitan global rulemaking is the 2001 Cape Town Convention on International Interests in Mobile Equipment. You know, I know this sounds like very exciting stuff. Let's say you're a bank that finances the purchase of a new 747-8 airplane, a roughly $400 million US plane. <clears throat> the plane itself is the collateral for the loan. Or let's say you own a 747 and you want to lease it to an air cargo company. If the buyer or the lessee defaults, right, you want to repossess the plane as the collateral for the loan. Right? But it could be anywhere. Right? How do you know whether you have the right to seize it? How do you know what procedures you have to go through to seize it? Does it matter where the airplane happens to be? And, and if so, on which date? Right? The, the date of the default on the loan or the date that you try to repossess it? Right? Different national laws have very different approaches to these kinds of questions. The Cape Town Convention tries to resolve those uncertainties. It's innovative in a number of ways, but I want to focus on two key related characteristics of this treaty its structure, and the drafting process that led to its adoption. First, like the FIDIC forms, the Cape Town Convention is not a single document. It's actually three separate protocols, one for aviation, planes, one for trains, and one for satellites, with a kind of umbrella treaty that bridges the three. The three protocols right, are dealing with vastly different market sectors, distinct economic contexts, distinct regulatory contexts. And the drafters of the Cape Town Convention actually agreed that these three separate protocols would take precedence over the core treaty in cases of conflict, right? The particular governs over the general. The structure was made possible, and here's where the drafting process innovation comes in, by the fact that industry groups and technical experts were closely involved with the drafting from the very beginning, especially the drafting of the three protocols. Uh, and the aviation working group, which you know, drafted the, the protocol for airplanes, was really credited with kind of maintaining the momentum that led to the adoption of the final text. Now, that process has led people to complain that the Cape Town Convention was basically written by Airbus and Boeing. And you know what? There's some truth to that. But it's not as though industry got its way on every aspect of the treaty. And in any event, states have rushed to ratify it, even though states that have no domestic you know, transportation manufacturing sector. Like they don't have any local industry to protect. It was, it was signed in 2001 and now has 84 contracting states, nearly as many as the CISG, which had a 30 year head start on the Cape Town Convention. So in sum, cosmopolitan globalized law can be just as international as globalist globalized law but it's often outside the realm of state sovereignty. It doesn't depend on sovereign consent, although it welcomes it, like with the Cape Town Convention, and often sort of drafts it into service to enforce the rules that were agreed on by private industry. It creates a legal infrastructure that is overlaid upon, but separate from national legal systems. Which takes me to my last topic for today, soup or salad. Uh, this part's more inward looking, it's more about the legal academy, but I think it's helpful to understanding the tension between globalism and cosmopolitanism. To a large extent, international law scholarship is associated with globalism and comparative law scholarship with cosmopolitanism. As the French scholar Bruno Appetit wrote in his Philosophie du droit, Philosophy of Law, uh, international law manifests a desire for unity and universality based on the common needs and interests of the international community. 
That's why if you read uh, public international law literature, you'll have seen so much concern with this concept of fragmentation in the past uh, roughly 15 or 20 years. For many public international lawyers, fragmentation represents you know, a threat to the universality, to the coherence of public international law. Uh, Marty Koskinyemi, the scholar most associated with concerns about fragmentation, calls it a postmodern anxiety, since it's bound up with kind of discomfort at the decline of traditional normative orders, especially those of the nation state. But cosmopolitans don't see fragmentation as a threat. They just see it as the international order maturing, providing more and more specific solutions to a wider and wider variety of specific problems. The project of international law is totalizing and has been from the beginning. That's not to say international law has no respect for diversity, right? The centrality of state sovereignty to most theories of international law shows that that's not the case. Sovereignty demands a degree of decentralization of diversity. So globalism does not necessarily mean getting rid of states and establishing a one world government. But it does mean establishing the global plane as the plane of regulation and reducing the impact of sovereignty in practice, even if its formal legal status is maintained. So international law is soup. Right? It seeks to combine, to unify, to blend together a single harmonious flavor. Right? There is an underlying variety, but it's mixed into a complex but unitary whole. Comparative law, right? the legal expression of cosmopolitanism, is a salad, right? tossed, not blended. The component parts don't lose their separate identities when they're mixed together. It's not the, the contrast right, between different ingredients is part of the goal in making a salad. Right? Sweet and bitter greens, uh, crunchy and juicy, uh, dry and chewy. Right? I know it's lunchtime. I won't, I won't go any further. Um, so unlike globalists, Cosmopolitans are not trying to homogenize, to blend together, but rather to celebrate difference. They don't seek to remake the global order, but rather to improve it through the application of technical expertise and cultural sensitivity. In other words, they embrace the technical and particularistic discourse that international law scholars worry about. David Kennedy, a, a great scholar, a theorist of comparative law at Harvard writes, in relation to other internationalist fields and projects, Comparativists act as the diversity department, reassuring either that cultural differences can be accommodated or that they may remain safely and even pleasurably exotic. Comparativists participate in the broader legal academic project of explaining, apologizing for, and stabilizing elite understanding of the autonomous role of law in society as a force at once effective in society but safely removed from political and ideological manipulation. So in this way, the cosmopolitan ethos, operationalized through comparative law methods, can be seen as fundamental to a diversified vision of international lawmaking. Globalists find that their governance projects are challenged, are criticized by reference to cultural differences and to historical patterns of colonialism and Western hegemony. So for example, right, how can human rights be universal when some cultures vary, value the community more than the individual and others the individual more than the community? How can patent rights be universal when cultures value originality to different extents? Isn't this all just a way of codifying Western values and you know, reinforcing Western dominance? Comparativists, by contrast, are professionally attuned to cultural difference. You can't study patterns of legal transplantation from one jurisdiction to another without understanding the particularities of the legal system and the legal culture of both the source and the recipient of the legal transplant. Comparativists identify culture with the local rather than the global, with a project of understanding differences rather than erasing differences. Let me conclude by looking toward the future. Globalized law is not an end product, right? It is an organic phenomenon, reactive to changing events, always evolving. The globalist and cosmopolitan tendencies have always existed side by side and interacted with each other. What we are seeing now is not a retreat from globalization, but I think it is a retreat from globalism. What I can say with confidence is that it is not a product of the pandemic or of resurgent nationalist uh, uh, sort of populism in the past few years. Formal statist globalist rulemaking 
has been famously stagnating for at least 20 years at institutions like the WTO, roughly since the end of the Cold War. Perhaps it's a backlash to the legal dominance of the West or the North, depending how you look at it, but at minimum, it has been brewing since the great wave of decolonization in the 1960s. Perhaps the project of harmonizing law has simply reached its logical endpoint. There is a reason, and not just a politically correct reason, that diversity is a buzzword in many fields these days. My own greatest familiarity is with the international arbitration field, where the past decade has seen intense efforts to diversify the field. Not just in the ways that we sort of associate with diversity at, at, a, at a more superficial level, like encouraging more women, more people from the global south, and so on, uh, to join the field, to become appointed as arbitrators. But also, right, we're seeing diversification in rulemaking itself. After decades of efforts to try to get every state cooperating in applying the same standards to enforce arbitral awards, after decades of rapid spread of procedural innovations among all the major arbitral institutions, we're now seeing much more variety, more institutions that serve only a particular region or that specialize in a particular industry, sets of codified rules that represent different perspectives on arbitration procedure, providing parties with that cosmopolitan menu of options from which they can choose. Innovation in the ways that mediation is mixed with arbitration, for example. Recognition that the localization of global standards as they get to be applied by national judiciaries and codified into local laws, it is not just inevitable, but it's desirable. Peretz Banson once wrote that the transnational legal setting opens up an endless vista, excuse me, a vista on endless confrontations and conflicts between different interest groups, rationalities, and stakes. It's the very endlessness of those confrontations that interests me about this field. Uniformity will always be in tension with diversity, globalism with cosmopolitanism. To determine what form globalized law is likely to take in the future, what I think you have to do is identify which networks are likely to win these confrontations. I put win in, in quotation marks. And by doing so, we'll exert the greatest influence on the development of the law. Those will not necessarily be the largest networks by number, I think they're going to be the networks that are the most cohesive, the most able to act collectively and establish themselves past that tipping point beyond which network effects make it hard to reverse them. For decades, the strongest networks were those of states, what during the Cold War was called the first, second, and third worlds, the US and its allies, the Soviet Union and its allies, and the so-called non-aligned movement. After the Cold War, the most intensive sustained interactions, the most cohesion was with multinational corporations. And that explains the dominance of neoliberal economic theories in the 1990s and 2000s, and the associated globalized legal structures that reproduce and reinforce corporate models of self-governance. My best guess, it's just a guess, but my best guess about what comes next is regionalism, right? a fusion of public and private governance at above the national but below the global level. What I can say for sure is that what comes next will not be the end, but will just be another stage in a series of endless reconfigurations of the global community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua, for the insightful sharing. So I guess we're now moving toward the Q&A session. But before then, perhaps let me uh, use my privilege as a moderator to uh, point out several questions that I'm mm -hmm. of interest in. So I guess I have three general questions. The first question relates to your uh, topic and your finding. You're trying to uh, demystify the concept of deglobalization. And my understanding is that you uh, distinguish between the concept of globalization and globalism. And you try to argue that what we observe is more like a, a trend against the globalism, but not necessarily a trend against globalization. Yeah. And I guess the difference is uh, while well, lies in your understanding with the, of the difference between the globalism and cosmopolitanism, in the sense that uh, globalism focuses more on the uniformity, consistency, uh, etc., while you disagree with the desirability of uh, emphasizing the uniformity or 
consistency and private laws. But isn't that a question of degree? In a sense, uh, cosmopolitanism also pursues some degree of uniformity and consistency as well, right? Otherwise, it would be simply localization yes. or differentiation. Yeah. Uh, differentiation. But uh, it seems like both are the ways to pursue some form or some degree of uh, uniformity or consistency. And what makes them different might be a degree of pursuit. But isn't that something that those uh, the globalization Apple case concerned of? Aren't they just concerned of the well, the reduced consistency mm -hmm. in the world? Uh, so how do you make a distinction uh, di distinction between the two concepts? That that would be my first question. The second question would be a more uh, general question. So you mentioned that the the motive behind your speech was uh, um, largely come from coming from. Uh, your expertise in international dispute resolution. How do you connect this speech with uh, international dispute resolution laws or international arbitration laws? How did international dispute resolution laws inspire your observation here? So that would be my second question. And my third question would be, uh, since we're now in Taiwan, so I'm interested in how you observe the Taiwan's law or the Taiwan's role in this globalism versus cosmopolitanism debate. Uh, as you are familiar with, uh, while Taiwan has some limits to be part of the globalism, mm -hmm. world, the globalist world, so uh, I would assume that Taiwan can take advantage of this uh, difference between these two concepts and try to find a position for Taiwan to suit itself. Uh, for example, I might well, if you're you're right that uh, well the de global well the de globalism mm -hmm. is coming and we are witnessing some some reduced uh, consistency or uniformity in private laws. Then what role can Taiwan, um, uh, an economy or a jurisdiction mm -hmm. that has difficulty in joining the right. global world or a multilateral world, uh, can take amidst this uh, new trend? So what would your observation be? Yeah. So that would be my third question. Thank you, thank you for those. Um, thank you for those, all three very thought-provoking questions. Uh, I'd say the first, yes. I mean, globalism and cosmopolitanism both seek some degree of, of increased consistency. Right? They are both forms of globalization. The difference is, I think it's not so much one of degree as one of emphasizing what. I wouldn't say that cosmopolitans care less about uniformity but they care about different kinds of uniformity. They're not so much against inconsistency as against arbitrary inconsistencies, right? And look for groups that make sense together, right? And so that, that's kind of actually the link to your third question, which I'll take next, which is where, where is a role for Taiwan in this? I think to a large extent, Taiwan has been pursuing a cosmopolitan strategy for many years, emphasizing areas where technical experts can join global rulemaking processes and provide a voice for Taiwan in a more depoliticized context. Um, where does it go next? Uh, I think partly regionalization. Um, I saw two pieces of news this morning. Uh, one about Taiwan's efforts to join the CPTPP, uh, the rebranded, formerly called Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and Related to that, a lot of Taiwan's efforts in, in relation to working more with ASEAN. Um, and then the other uh, piece of news that I saw that I think is, is telling is TSMC having announced the construction of new, two new factories, one in Kaohsiung and one in the United States, simultaneously, right? Producing, a, uh, pursuing a strategy in, in those two jurisdictions. So I think cosmopolitanism can involve a reconfiguration right, shifts in what are the borders. They don't necessarily have to be geographical borders. But that Taiwan would be best placed to make common cause with other jurisdictions that share its values. Now, those might be broader cultural values, such as are common across Asian cultures. You know, Vietnamese family culture and so on, very similar to Chinese family culture. Right? There's, there's areas where people can find commonalities and values there but also common cause in terms of political and economic goals. Um, so, I mean, the, the Canadian government has been seeking in more and more forceful terms about an alliance of democracies, 
And I think that's probably where Taiwan could most profitably find a place for itself um, in not necessarily a global order, but an international order. Uh, now, my own personal story, um, I, I think perhaps I was kind of a cosmopolitan all along, although I didn't realize it. Uh, I didn't have a word for it until more recently. Um, before I went to law school, I planned to join the Foreign Service to become a, a, a member of the Canadian Diplomatic Corps. Uh, and I think I've just always been one of those people who was fascinated by difference. And I encountered international arbitration as a legal field al almost by accident. When I started law school, I had never heard of it. I think like most people, like a lot of lawyers have never heard of it, uh, even experienced dispute resolution lawyers. Uh, and it was really just because of the Vismut um, that you know, I, I later coached teams that I heard about it in the first place. But I immediately felt comfortable uh, in that environment. And I think the reason is that in the international arbitration practice community, legal chauvinists, people who insist that there is one right way of doing things, cannot possibly succeed. Because every international arbitration involves at least two legal systems, because it involves at least parties from two different countries. And it often involves arbitrators from third, fourth, fifth countries, uh, perhaps outside counsel from a different uh, legal background as their client. So there's always this constant kind of mixing and matching of different substantive laws and different procedural laws. And pretty much everything about international commercial arbitration practice, and to an extent investor state arbitration practice as well, is, has been arrived at through a series of hybridization organic processes as you know, three members of an arbitration tribunal, each with different background, try to find a consensus, that, you know, an award that they can all sign. And it happens very naturally and organically. Um, and so uh, in, a, in a different paper I published a couple of years ago, uh, I described international arbitration as comparative law in action. Right? Comparative law is often seen as an academic discipline, not as a, something that you can practice as a lawyer. But I think in international commercial arbitration, you do actually practice comparative law because you always have multiple substantive and procedural laws. You always have conflict of laws questions. And that's just the formal law, right? That leaves aside the kind of cultural hybridization, trying to convince people from a different legal background uh, and so on. Um, so it was really, I think that's what drew me to arbitration as a practice area in the first place. And then arbitration got me thinking about these kind of organically hybridized forms of legal process. And then I started seeing some of the same patterns in other areas of law. Uh, that I was studying. I hope that answers the questions. Yeah, So uh, let's open the floor for the audience. So uh, does anyone have a question? Uh, yes, please. Hello, Professor. How, how are you doing? So I got more of these two. Uh, about the problems that were put back. So that's a part I knew about the culture of Canada, uh, the country has a job to live in the best language, but still have to carry its own measure of taking medical law, with a principle of standardizing, and based upon what I know from, but based, based on what I'm learning from law school, there's a professor to come my way with the medicine, to have the president itself take an analogy to the, the, to the legal system of Canada, and especially when some of the, uh, some of the Canadian problems I mentioned in Canada has adopted different type of language. So how does the district or the court work, uh, work out in terms of the international law? Or is it just direct analogy to American law? Because we're talking about the actual cost, cost of so is it the massive law of the United States for the answer question of global lesson with cosmopolitan? How many of the Canadians don't understand of the Anglo American law? That's not issue. Yeah, that's a that's a complicated question. It'll take me a minute. It's a, it's a complicated question. There's a there's a lot in there. So Canada is often described as a bi-jural country, 
and Quebec as a civil law jurisdiction, but it isn't really a civil law jurisdiction. Uh, in terms of stare decisis, Quebec is as much common law as the rest of Canada. It's just that it has a code-based private law. So the, the relationship between Quebec law and federal law in Canada, it's quite different than the relationship between state law and federal law in the United States. Uh, although Louisiana has some similarities in that it also has some, some civil code derived traditions. So the, the substantive law of Quebec on private law is very similar to French law, but the procedural law is, is British derived sort of Anglo-American style common law with stare decisis. And you get some very interesting linguistic issues that arise there where all federal statutes in Canada must be equally authoritative in English and in French. And so often courts of appeal in the provinces are presented with arguments that a statute has to be given a particular meaning because that's the only meaning that makes sense in both official languages. But it's, it's not a very stable combination in the context of Quebec is the truth. And there's constantly a tension between the civil law nature of Quebec law, in what we call the black letter law, sort of on paper, and the common law nature of court procedures in Quebec. They don't work very well together, right? A code-based substantive law, but a precedent-based court system. There's a kind of a, not a, a necessary contradiction there, but there is definitely a, a tension. What I have to say, and, and this is, it doesn't make me proud or happy to say that, is that outside Quebec, Canada has a very traditional, inward-looking, nationalistic kind of legal culture that really still looks to England for guidance. A, a lot of substantive laws have been inspired by other sources. Um, for example, our, 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 like Taiwan, Canadian securities law is partly inspired by American law, our, our competition law also. But Canadian private law outside of Quebec, is, it's not just still based on English law, it's often 100-year-old English law um, that has been amended and updated in England, but not in Canada. The Canadian legal establishment is very traditional and very conservative. So I don't actually think, unfortunately, of Canada as a very cosmopolitan legal jurisdiction, except for Quebec, which is high, highly cosmopolitan. It looks to, to France, it looks to the United States, it looks to the rest of Canada, and to the, and to the other common law jurisdictions as well. Uh, academically, it's the only province where there's real strength in comparative law in the law schools. Um, outside Quebec, it's sort of, I think it's actually embarrassing how few comparative law experts there are at Canadian law schools. Um, so here I am, li li live streaming and, and recording sort of insulting remarks about my home country. Um, but no, no, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the short answer is it's complicated, it's political, and in Quebec, it can be very much an emotional issue. I think a lot of people in Quebec very much feel outnumbered in North America and are very concerned to preserve their traditions, including their Napoleonic code inheritance in their private law. But it doesn't fit very comfortably together with other aspects of Quebec law that are part of Canadian Federation. I appreciate your Thank you. Okay, thanks for having us on this uh, speech, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm Peter from the Red Schools, and I'm, and, uh, I have three questions today. So, first of all, I wonder, uh, there's a sentence that uh, you, uh, the professor mentioned in your speech is that the Kazuhal doesn't see fragmentation as a threat. And you see that it was a more decentralized, more decentralized system. But I wonder if that uh, for big corporations, whether in Taiwan or in the United States, uh, the cost of compliance in, in the corporation is very important issues. Like we need to uh, comply with the laws in different countries. So I wonder if these kind of fragmentation will make the cost of compliance be higher or lower. Because in my comments, uh, in my thought and in the common sense is that if we don't have a unified system or we don't have a unified uh, like corresponding party different regime, different legal origin, jurisdictions, then it will become very 
troublesome for you to have compliance process because you need to find different uh, institutions, you need to find different rulers, you need to find, you need to do lobbying in different ways. And second thing is that uh, I wonder this kind of uh, legal cosmopolitan will challenge will it challenge the concept of universal human rights. Like if we think that human rights uh, is a unified system, unified legal system, then we may have contradiction between the legal cosmopolitanism and the universal human rights concept. And the third part is that I wonder if uh, cosmopolitanism will be substitute to all big uh, international law systems. Like I, uh, my thought is that maybe in some part of the international law, it might be better to use globalism rather than cosmopolitanism. Like if we have a common goal, we need to achieve and we need a foreign consensus, we need a very unified system to encourage or to consolidate every country to work together or cooperate together, then maybe globalism will be a better way to solve this kind of problem, like global problem, like uh, maybe uh, uh, terrorism, uh, global warming, this kind of issues like that. So all of my three questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you said Peter is your name? Thank you. Those are, those are also very interesting questions. First, um, I, I should clarify, when I said that cosmopolitanism doesn't see fragmentation as a threat, what I meant, I was referring to the public international law literature where they talk about norm fragmentation. So not fragmentation into different national laws, but fragmentation into separate international laws of, say, international environmental law, international criminal law, international human rights law, international investment law. Uh, norm fragmentation, I don't think cosmopolitanism sees as a threat. Uh, it might still see fragmentation along national borders, so genuine deglobalization as a problem. So there, the two probably would agree. Will cosmopolitanism challenge the universality of human rights? I think it might. Um, and it's one of the concerns I have about it, and, and that sort of, that it can very easily become moral relativism, uh, or at least can be exploited by bad actors to reinforce moral relativism. And that is something that I worry about. Um, it, so are there some, I, I'm gonna combine that with your third question. I, I do think there are some areas where cosmopolitanism can be a problem. Uh, in particular, those where collective action is required, like you, you gave the example of, of you know, combating global climate change, and I agree there. But I think also more generally, there, there is a danger to specialization generally, in that <clears throat> the more specialized you are, the easier it is to lose track of the basic principles, the fundamental values, because you get sidetracked into a technical discourse. <clears throat> And you see this especially with specialized dispute resolution bodies, uh, like very industry-specific arbitral institutions, where the only people who understand the discourse are 20-year specialists. So the only people who can be appointed to the adjudicative positions within that institution are the ones who have spent the last 20 years representing you know, the companies that are involved in it. And you know, through no malice or evil intent, you spend 20 years representing a particular viewpoint, you're going to internalize that viewpoint. It's inevitable, it's, it's human nature. And so you can very much have sort of the, the, the logic of profit take precedence over other values. Uh, and so I do think that there are places where the kind of uh, norm fragmentation that in some ways is not problematic, places where it can be problematic. And those in particular are areas of externalities, as the economists call it, where benefit to members of the community imposes costs on other members of the community. The more rulemaking is confined within the bounds of a society, and the more people who are not part of that society lack a voice in rulemaking, the more likely it is that costs or harms will be pushed off onto those outsiders. So yes, that is something I'm concerned about. Follow up on that question, actually. Uh, so, I guess it's totally possible that the custom of politicism might be a threat to the universal human rights. But on this, at the same time, it could also contribute to the universal human rights. Uh, well, it's a basically a bottom up approach, right? And when the bottom cares about uh, the human rights, then, it, well, when the bottom cares about the human rights more than the top, then it is possible to formulate some rules. 
So like uh, the reasons uh, emerge as the concept of ESG as uh, promoted through the global supply chain would be somehow portrayed as a market versus state or uh, business versus the international organization um, kind of development. So I guess uh, well, you're right that it really, it really is about whether the actor is a good actor or a bad actor. And it could be on both ways. But this is, so that's an example, uh, and ESG is an excellent example of it, of where the, the tippy market of networks, the tippy uh, character of, of network markets can have beneficial effects. So ESG, uh, we now have after the recent elections in the United States, the Republican Party taking control of, of one house of Congress and promising to roll back ESG practices. But the corporate lobbyists, who mostly donated to Republican politicians in the first place, are rejecting that. And they want to maintain the ESG standards that they have negotiated and adopted for themselves. Right? So I think the same thing could, in principle, happen with human rights, that if enough states subscribe so that the lowest common denominator becomes a certain level of respect for human rights, joining the international economic <clears throat> network would require subscribing to some of those basic um, uh, common denominators. So uh, a state, for example, that is willing to hold itself separate from global society like North Korea, you probably can't change them. But states that want to be integrated into the world economy may find themselves slower than we might like, more unevenly than we might like, but constrained to follow the network once it's established. Uh, 
uh, undoubtedly it's a, a globalized law, the New York Convention or other uh, similar conventions. But uh, in those conventions, there uh, it also includes some national or fragment. How do you say that? But those elements. So can we see it's a combination of the inner middle of the Casino palette, uh, globalism and Casino palette tends. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. So I mean, the, the, the public policy exception to enforcement of awards, it's kind of like the, the strongest example of, let's say, non-unification in the New York Convention. But it's not the only one. So for example, the validity of an arbitration agreement is determined under the New York Convention according to the law chosen by the parties, or failing that, the law of the seat of arbitration. So it's domestic contract law. Um, and we, we very much see differences. In fact, there's a, a, a case that recently went up to the highest courts in the UK and France, the Kababji case, where the two countries came to different conclusions on which law applies to the arbitration agreement and therefore opposite conclusions on whether the arbitration agreement was valid. But I think that's not so much a case of cosmopolitanism as an attempt at globalism that states rejected in part that they didn't want to give up too much control. Um, and if you look at the, the drafting history of the New York Convention, the drafts that were prepared uh, referred not to national public policy, but to international public policy. <clears throat> and the rules on validity, the original drafts, referred to just the law to which the arbitration agreement is subject. And not and failing that, the law of the seat. So those were two areas where the drafters of the convention, sort of the arbitration specialists, tried to have a more globalist vision enacted. But states weren't willing to go that far. Right? States still said, well, if our court systems are going to be used to enforce these private decisions, right? if, if taxpayer money is going to be used uh, for private purposes, we want to have some control to make sure that our fundamental values are not being violated. So I, I would describe it less as a, a cosmopolitan, as a successful attempt at cosmopolitanism, but rather as an incompletely successful attempt at globalism. Uh, my question is uh, about commercial laws. Is that, uh, is globalism or cosmopolitanism? Cosmopolitanism is like there is a goal for like for something like principle, or is that possible to regulate more detailed stuff like business law or something? Is that and maybe it it might touch the differences in the country's economic system or something? That how to I I believe it can be a principle, but how can it? Uh, become more detailed, just to fit into different things. No, I mean, that, uh, that's something that really goes to kind of the, the very core of, of all rulemaking. Uh, so principles versus rules, or in the US they call it standards versus rules. Um, you know, how much do you sort of set out general principles that you want applied and leave the detailed elaboration of the consequences to individual judges or arbitrators or so on in individual cases, versus on the other hand, setting out more specific rules in advance. It's not a perfect fit, but I think as a general tendency, more globalist visions are more principle-based and cosmopolitan visions are more rule-based, more particularized. And I think the reason for that is that most cosmopolitan laws and this isn't just commercial law, but commercial law, you can see it the most clearly, they start from the users, right? It's the bottom up. And businesses in particular always want decisions to be made by specialized experts, however they define expertise for themselves. Whereas states often want to have generalist decision makers who can keep in mind sort of the, the big picture. Uh, one of the big debates in investor state arbitration right now is whether there ought to be a permanent investment court or a permanent appeal body versus independent ad hoc arbitration tribunals. 
And one of the arguments that has been made, especially by the European Union, in favor of an international investment court is that the people appointed to it will be able to have a broader perspective because they won't need to be arbitration specialists. Right? Arbitration has become such a complicated technical field that you almost have to specialize in it to become successful. Uh, and so the argument was made, similar to what I was saying before in response to another question, that if you draw your arbitrators only from the ranks of people who were arbitration lawyers before, you'll get people who have a mastery of the rules but have lost sight of the principles. Um, that again, th there's, no, there's no answer. It's a question of, of emphasis, of, of where you put more weight or less weight. But yes, I, I do think it's fair to say that globalism is more associated with a principles-based set and cosmopolitanism with a rules-based set. I, I think not as a matter of ideology, but as a practical matter of the rulemaking processes, whether they're more top-down or bottom-up. Thank you. Uh if there is no further question, I think uh, we can fairly say that uh, we can conclude this speech. And thank you, Professor Carter, again for joining us, uh, visiting us, and giving us this wonderful speech. Thank you.